Welcome to the Lessons for Living television program. My name is Bill Santos. Thank you so much for watching. Now, our subject today is a vital one. It is the sin that God cannot forgive. And we're going to see that the subject is a solid one because the destiny of everybody remains on this point. The unpardonable sin is not something that is committed only by a few very terrible people. As a matter of fact, when our Lord comes, everybody in the world will have committed the unpardonable sin except for the saved. In a very real sense, the only reason why people are lost is over this sin, the unpardonable sin. Now, why should we be interested in this topic anyway? Well, first of all, there are a lot of people that are anxious about it. They are afraid that by some word, by some haphazard action, that they will do the thing or say the thing that God cannot forgive, and we need to clear that up. Now, let's get into it. I'm intending that this message should be a message of encouragement as well as a message of warning. The time that Jesus mentioned that there is a sin beyond forgiveness is recorded in the 12th chapter of Matthew, verses 31 and 32. Uh, Jesus here is speaking, and here's what he says. Therefore, I tell you that people will be forgiven every sin and insult to God, but insulting the Holy Spirit won't be forgiven, and whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit won't be forgiven, not in this age or in the age that is coming. So then, well, well then what is this sin? Well, let's examine the words that Jesus used. Jesus said that all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven. There is nothing that anybody has done that God cannot forgive. Nothing that we've done that he can't forgive if we confess. So the unpardonable sin is not some ill-advised word that slips out. You say then, okay, then what is the unpardonable sin? Well, there is nothing that a man does with his hands or says with his lips. Jesus said, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven. And that's, well, that's one of the most comforting things in the word of God, isn't it? It says that there's nothing that Jesus can't forgive. Now, let's do some simple reasoning together. The Spirit of God is in the heart, isn't he? He's in the middle of us, inside of us. And he comes into our lives. Therefore, the unpardonable sin is something that happens inside a person because the Holy Spirit is inside. The unpardonable sin is not something you do. It becomes who you are. The sin against the Holy Spirit is internally committed. It's a perfectly respectable sin that doesn't cause eyebrows to be raised. A sin that, well, it could be committed right in the church. And no one would even look at you a second time. The person sitting in the next pew, they would be none the wiser because it happens inside a heart. It's not an action. It's a condition. It is a condition that is brought about within the life by continually refusing to follow the leading of the Spirit of God. And if you don't follow, then you remain behind. And he walks off and leaves you because you don't follow. By that time, we don't hear his voice anymore because the voice of the Holy Spirit is silent in the heart until you don't feel anything. You are, as what the Apostle Paul said, past feeling. I don't feel anything wrong anymore. Now, let's look at this. Now, why is this sin beyond forgiveness? I'm going to submit to you 
that the easiest way to understand it is really not so much by a definition as it is by looking into the lives of the people who did it. See how they did it. Perhaps it is best understood by an illustration. And we're also going to look into the life of a man who almost did it, and why he almost did it, and how he escaped it. Now, I'm going to hold up to you two men. They knew one another. Both of these men were kings of Israel. The first king of Israel was a man, a very handsome man, a man with a tremendous physique, a very impressive fellow, intelligent and strong physically, and his name was Saul. And we're going to notice from the Bible that he committed the unpardonable sin. Let's see how his early experience was. I'm going to turn with you to the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 10. And I'm going to hold up a picture of a man who is obviously filled with the Holy Spirit of God. When he was anointed king over Israel, we read in 1 Samuel, chapter 10, and verse 6, the following. Then the Lord's Spirit came over you, and you will be caught up in a prophetic frenzy right along with them, and it will be like you become a completely different person. The Spirit of God came upon Saul with such fullness, he was a prophet. The record says that he turned into another man. Now, what does that mean in light of the New Testament? It means that he was converted. He was a new person. Look at 1 Samuel 10, verses 9 and 10. And just as Saul turned to leave Samuel's side, God gave him a different heart. And all these signs happened that very same day. When Saul and the boy got to Gibeah, there was a group of prophets coming to meet him. And God's spirit came over Saul, and he was caught up in a prophetic frenzy right along with them. What's that? Well, it's conversion, isn't it? I think you would agree that it is difficult to read in the Bible a story that more clearly tells about a man who was converted, filled with the Holy Spirit, a prophet in his own right, a new heart, a new man. Certainly Saul had the Holy Spirit. Now that's 1 Samuel chapter 10. Now, we're going to turn just six chapters later to the 16th chapter and read in verse 14. So, 1 Samuel 16, verse 14. Now, the Lord's Spirit had departed from Saul. It says here, now the Spirit left. The Spirit of God that gave him even that gift of prophecy in chapter 10 leaves him in chapter 16, and he was a lost man. So don't tell me that a man can't be converted and then lose redemption. Here is a classic case. Do you know why the Holy Spirit left? Well, the record of why the Holy Spirit left is in chapter 15. I want to read a few verses here, and I think you will get the picture. So, an order came from the Lord, and the prophet Samuel delivered that message to the king as follows. 1 Samuel 15, verse 3, it says, So go attack the Amalekites, put everything that belongs to them under the ban. Spare no one, kill men and women, children and infants, oxen and sheep, camels and donkeys. That was God's order. It was categorical. Destroy every Amalekite. Destroy everything they have. Now, the order is clear. Even though we may have questions about it, it is unequivocal. So now Saul sets out. He attacks the Amalekites, and he did almost everything the Lord said. 1 Samuel 15, verse 9. Saul and the troops spared Agag along with the best sheep, 
cattle, fattened calves, lambs, and everything of value. They weren't willing to put them under the ban, but anything that was despised or of no value, they placed under the ban. You see, they went contrary to the order of the Lord. Saul returns from battle, and who does he meet? He meets the prophet Samuel. And Samuel comes to Saul, and Saul says to him in some very pious language, it's 1 Samuel 15, beginning at verse 13, when Samuel reached Saul, Saul greeted him, the Lord bless you. I have done what the Lord said. Then what, Samuel asked, is the bleeding of sheep in my ears and the mooing of cattle I hear? They were taken from the Amalekites, Saul said, because the troops spared the best sheep and cattle in order to sacrifice them to the Lord your God. The rest was placed under the ban. Now, verses 18 to 23 says, this is the prophet responding, the Lord sent you on a mission instructing you, go and put the sinful Amalekites under the ban. Fight against them until you've wiped them out. Why didn't you obey the Lord? You did evil in the Lord's eyes when you tore into the plunder. Did I obey the Lord? Saul protested to Samuel. I went on the mission the Lord sent me on. I captured Agag, the Amalekite king. And I put the Amalekites under the ban. Yes, the troops took the sheep and the cattle from the plunder, the very best items placed under the ban, but in order to sacrifice them to the Lord your God at Gilgal. Then Samuel replied, Does the Lord want entirely burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as obedience to the Lord? Listen to this. Obeying is better than sacrificing. Paying attention is better than fat from rams because rebellion is as bad as the sin of divination. Arrogance is like the sin of idolatry because you have rejected what the Lord said. He has rejected you as king. Now let's put this all together. Saul committed the unpardonable sin. He partially obeyed, but not all the way. That's one of the most dangerous traps that a person can fall into. And that is the road that leads straight to the unpardonable sin. Saul partially obeyed. He didn't go all the way. He obeyed most of what God asked him to do, but not all. You see, to reject part of what God asks us to do is to reject all of God. The Lord will be Lord of all, or he won't be Lord at all. Now Saul said, well, we have the best intentions. We brought the sheep for an offering. We're going to take them to the church. But the Lord didn't want those sheep and those oxen. We cannot honor God by disobeying. If Saul were here today, he would say, don't give religious reasons for your disobedience. Obey the Lord or his spirit will leave you. You'll see that the pardonable sin is an act of disobedience. And it may be so small that it involves just a few sheep. But it can cost you eternal life. Now, the second king of Israel was a man by the name of David. I know you are all familiar with his story. Now, David did not commit the unpardonable sin, but he was right on the edges of it. And that's why we have to talk about him. Let me ask you, did David know about the unpardonable sin? Well, he certainly did. You remember that David wrote most of the Psalms, and in the 51st Psalm, Look at what David wrote, Psalm 51, verse 11. Please don't throw me out of your presence. Please don't take your Holy Spirit away from me. Did David know about the unpardonable sin? He certainly did. He said, don't take your Holy Spirit away from me. Now let's talk about David's moral life. David killed a man. The man's name was Uriah. 
He was a Hittite. He was one of the most faithful men in David's army. While he was out fighting the battles of the kingdom for David, he left his beautiful wife at home. And one day she was taking a bath. And from the vantage point of the top of the palace, David looked over there and saw her taking a bath. And he became lustful of her. He sent a messenger down that the king had asked her to come to his palace. And when she came, well, you know what happened. She becomes pregnant. Uriah hasn't been home, so the child couldn't be his. So David tried to give him a leave and send him home so that when the child was born, at least he would believe the child was his. But instead, Uriah was so conscientious about doing his duty out on the front line as a soldier that not even the thoughts of his beautiful wife would take him home. And so when he stayed out there on the front line, he stayed and he stayed until it was impossible for them to cover up the fact that she was with child by David. David had to carry the thing to the end point. And they forced Uriah into the front of the lines and Uriah the Hittite was killed so that David could legitimize the thing that he had done. One sin was compounded by another. Now here was murder on top of adultery. David was in deep water. As a matter of fact, David never quite regained the respect of the people of the kingdom. And as a consequence of David's action, the people of Israel went down into a slew of immorality. David was powerless to stop it. If he opened his mouth to say anything, the people would say, who are you to talk after what you did? Well, because everyone knew what he had done. So David did a terrible, terrible thing, didn't he? Everybody knew about it. It was a scandal. That's the way sin is. It doesn't stay in a small package. It has the way of poisoning the lives of others. It was in light of this terrible thing that David wrote the 51st Psalm. Now, I suppose many of you have read the 51st Psalm. Some read it with ice water in their veins, but you can't read it that way. I want to read a portion of the psalm in the spirit that I think David wrote it. Remember, this is a man that is heartbroken over his own sins. Listen to this, beginning at verse 1. Have mercy on me, God, according to your faithful love. Wipe away my wrongdoings according to your great compassion. Wash me completely clean of my guilt. Purify me from my sin because I know my wrongdoings. My sin is always right in front of me. I've sinned against you and you alone. I've committed evil in your sight. That's why you are justified when you render your verdict completely correct when you issue your judgment. I've done wrong. I've been wrong. You see that, don't you? He was afraid that God would take away his spirit and now he'd be lost forever. So let's just compare those two kings for just a moment. So how is it that God can save David and he can't save Saul? Morally, certainly David is a far worse character. Certainly saving a few sheep is nowhere near as bad as having a man killed and committing adultery with his wife. So why couldn't God save Saul? You know why? It's all back there in the book that we were just reading a moment ago. Back in 1 Samuel 15. What's the problem? It's not the few sheep. That's trivial. The problem is Saul's attitude. He wouldn't admit that he had done anything wrong. The unpardonable sin is in the attitude. The reason why the Spirit of God leaves a person's life, it's because their attitude is wrong. It's not what they do so much as it is their attitude about what they do. 
the Spirit of God is taken from a person that will not repent, even if it's only a few sheep. The unpardonable sin is an attitude of self-justification in wrongdoing. It's, down, it's a downright refusal to obey the will of the Lord. And it may involve only a few sheep. Let's look at David's attitude. And you see the difference why God can save David and he couldn't save Saul. And why the Holy Spirit didn't leave David because he said, my sin is ever before me. Against you and you only I've sinned. And I've done what is evil in your sight. Purify me, cleanse me. The attitude of David was that he repented. He confessed his sins. The unpardonable sin is simply a refusal to repent. It becomes obvious that religion and the deep religious devotion is not a protection against this sin. As a matter of fact, it may be a hazard. A degraded man knows that he ought to change. These people are doing nothing wrong outwardly, nothing bad outwardly. They were convinced that Jesus was the right person. But they did not want to accept him. You see, God is telling us something here. He's telling us that sometimes religious people are in a very dangerous position. So what is the unpardonable sin? It's, re it's rebellion. It's saying, I know what you want of me, but I'm not going to do it. What is the unpardonable sin? It's rebellion and stubbornness. And if we're to use just one word, it is indifference. What is the unpardonable sin? It's knowing the law of God and refusing to follow becoming insensitive and indifferent, seeing with your own eyes the evidence of the power of truth and thinking that we can live without it. What is the unpardonable sin? It's knowing God's will and refusing to walk in it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the assurance that every Every sin is forgiven. And Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit not be taken from us, that we come before you in acknowledgement of our wrongdoings, knowing that you are faithful and just to forgive us of all of our confessed sins. And for that, we praise you and thank you. Bless each and every viewer, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we've come to the end of another Lessons for Living television program. I want to thank you for joining us. We really appreciate you making the decision to be here with us. It's, it's, it's really important to us. Uh, before we go, I want to remind you of a few things that we have available so that we can remain connected throughout, you know, the week in between our broadcasts. One of them is the website, l4ltv.com, various tabs on the website. One of them is the Previous Programs tab. On that page, you have access to every program that we've ever aired. You can check that out. Uh, on that Previous Programs tab, there is also an audio version of the program that you can download from SoundCloud, and you can then listen to the program, you know, in your car or, you know, on your phone as you, you know, do your activities throughout the day. Our program plays really well as just an audio version, so check that out also. While on the website, you'll see there's a tab that is called Archived Sermons. It's different messages that I've given around the country on different topics. There is a video and then there's a downloadable uh, handout lesson study that you can have to help you better deepen your understanding of that particular topic. There's a Donate Today tab where as the name suggests, you can make a donation uh, to our ministry. We are a charitable organization, so your donation is eligible for a receipt that you can use in income tax purposes. Every penny that's donated gets reinvested back into the ministry. It doesn't come to me in any, in any way. Uh, it 
pays for the studio time, the air time, the gifts, all of those things that are essential to keep the ministry on the air. So if you feel so moved to do so, then you can make a donation there also. A couple of other things, we have a Facebook page. Uh, check that out, like the Facebook page. Uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel. This way you'll be notified every time we add a new program. Uh, I mentioned SoundCloud, we're an audio version. Instagram, follow me on Instagram, Santos underscore Bill, every morning, 6.30 a.m. Eastern Time. I put out a one-minute devotional video. Folks tell me it's a great way to get their day going as they focus on, on things of heaven. So check that out. Follow me on Instagram, at Santos underscore Bill. Check out also our missionnowcanada.com website, which is the humanitarian overseas mission work that our ministry is involved with. Check that out. You might see something there that is exciting to you and of interest to you. Maybe you can join us on an upcoming trip. We are all out of time. Thank you so much for watching. We hope to do this again next time. We hope you'll be with us. God bless you.